I met Michael through a friend online on Twitter. Uh, I think it was early in the pan, or it was mid-pandemic. And I was falling in love with these beautiful images and designs and, and, and projects that Michael was sharing. And, and Michael was this architect in Seattle who was pushing us to think a little bit better about how we live as a community. Uh, at the time, I was just, I was in this two bedroom apartment. There was no cross ventilation. It was hot, it was sweaty, it was smelly. It wasn't desirable. And, and I was looking at these, these, uh, these buildings from other parts of, uh, of the world and Europe and others, and Michael was saying, we too can do this. And one of the ways to think about that is, 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 uh, is not just about point access blocks and staircases, but just all, all, the, way, all the way around um, our, our zoning, our regulations, our building code, all of these pieces. And uh, um, it really made me think about how, you know, my parents are aging, where are they gonna go? Um, you know, I've got friends who, who probably can't afford a single family detached house, where are they gonna go? And so all of this, I thought, you know, I called Michael and said, can we get you up to Edmonton at some point? And the stars aligned and uh, because of folks like uh, Adam and uh, where's Josh Kajenner, uh, Josh and, and, and Danielle, um, uh, and uh, Brian and a few others, they, they helped say, yep, let's do this, let's try it out, and uh, here we are today. So Michael is, is, is not just a writer, not just an architect, not just a podcaster, not just all of these things. Michael is really pushing the envelope across North America about better buildings and better communities. And so I'm so excited that you took some of your time tonight to come here, Michael, and I'm really excited to hear your questions after his presentation as well. Everybody, please, a big Edmonton warm welcome to Michael Lyson. <laughs> Sorry, Michael, I think you gotta go higher. Higher on my lapel. Hmm? I'm partially deaf too. We're gonna try and up the volume here. Hmm? I need some help. You might have to hold it closer to your face. Okay, I can do that too. I can just hold it. Okay, thanks. All right. Federal gets built next year, what power would you want to be moved into that? Five years or four? Okay, we'll, 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 okay. See, if, we'll see if it works, yeah. Okay, we'll give it a shot. Uh, so control L. Uh, thank you to Maid, uh, Josh, and everyone else for your support in bringing me out here. Uh, so why are we here? Um, Michael is really interested in talking about better buildings, better communities. Uh, I know that Alberta is growing, uh, Canada is growing, lots of other places are growing. Um, I'm an architect by trade. Uh, I spent a couple years working in Germany. In Germany, urban planning and architecture are a little bit more uh, intermingled, I think, than they are here. Uh, I'm heavily invested in uh, ideas around mass timber, decarbonized buildings, Passive House, which is a low energy standard, Eco Districts, we'll talk about that tonight, Baugruppen, which are uh, kind of self-developed co-housing, social housing. Uh, I'm also uh, a car-free dad with two kids, so we try to live like this really kind of low carbon life. I don't know that we're succeeding, uh, but we are trying to make a difference and model what uh, alternative living could look like. Uh, I wanna note that we don't just have a housing crisis, right? We have the issues around climate adaptation, there's a massive public health crisis, social isola isolation is a bigger and bigger issue. So how do we start to address all of these things all together? Like I said, uh, this was just announced yesterday, right? Alberta is, Alberta is growing 4.5% this year, 5% next year. Uh, you guys are gonna need to build some housing. Uh, what's that gonna look like? Uh, I was actually surprised coming into the city that uh, farmland, forests, rivers, access to nature is much more prevalent here than I was thinking it would be. Uh, and it's certainly much more than, than Seattle. But there's this ongoing conversation that I have uh, around cities, like how easy is it for you to access nature? Do you have to do it with a car? Can you do it by transit? Can you do it by bike? Uh, in Seattle, we have these really awful development patterns. It's based on red line and kind of rezoning areas that already have multi multifamily housing. So it's kind of this urban cannibalism, right? We're taking areas that have existing multifamily housing and then we're raising the zoning on those. And so those affordable units uh, get demolished, new housing comes in, maybe it has affordable housing, maybe it doesn't. Uh, our building codes also induce these really fat, thick buildings. So really thick floor plates. Our buildings are kind of oriented the wrong way. Uh, in New Zealand, they call them sausage flats. I think this is a really funny term, but it seems kind of apropos. Uh, we have very little mid-rise in Seattle, though. So it's either kind of high rise, and then it falls almost immediately to low rise and mid rise. And this is kind of what it looks like. We have this hodgepodge, townhouses, uh, small apartment buildings, multiplexes. There's not a lot of open space. Uh, we do have uh, parking requirements in much of the city, uh, and so people put in cars. Um, but like I said, there's not a lot of open space. There's not a lot of trees. There's not a lot of community. Everyone is kind of in their own self-contained little bubble. Having lived in and worked in Germany, 
Uh, and in the US, I find that the model of what we're doing in the US and potentially in Canada to maybe not be so conducive to living in community. And we have this really bifurcated urbanism, right? In Seattle, we focus all of our density on the most toxic roads, right? So mid-rise buildings, six, seven, eight stories, and then almost immediately falling away to detached houses. I was walking around here earlier with Michael and was amazed that there's a six, six story building, five story building that's not on a main arterial and it's like in this quiet street. Uh, and it's actually similar to the kinds of environments that we had in Germany and it's almost non-existent in Seattle. So you guys are I think maybe pushing the boundary even more than we are a little bit. But there are some huge public health implications from focusing uh, density on these arterials, right? Uh, you're basically using affordable housing renters as kind of this buffer for noise and air pollution for the, the residents who live in the housing behind it. Uh, if you live on a noisy street, uh, the way that we design our buildings, you can't really get away from that noise even when your window is closed. You're kind of always uh, consuming the, the air pollution from the cars. I have a friend who lives on an arterial in Vancouver and if he opens his window for like 20 minutes, his entire place is just completely covered in, in dust and grime from the tires. And the way that we're redeveloping in our city isn't really conducive to making spaces that I think have better outcomes. This is a light rail station, and if you've ever been to Vancouver and you've seen their light rail stations in the suburbs, you might think we're at the towers. We don't have any. Uh, it's all low-rise zoning. There's a couple of mid-rise buildings. There's no pedestrian zone. There's almost no open space. Like in thinking about how to develop communities around transit, it's really the opposite direction of what I think we should be doing. All right, and so the red arrow, that's our light rail station. There's no housing above it. Um, as you can see, there aren't a lot of trees. There isn't a lot of places for, there aren't a lot of places for kids to play. We don't have a lot of housing diversity. It's mostly market rate housing, uh, token affordable housing here or there. No cooperatives, no bow um, You know, we don't have any slow streets or even closed streets for people to go out and mingle. And so, is this really climate adapted development? What kind of places are we building? And this is actually Edmonton. This is, uh, you guys do sausage flats too. Uh, this is, uh, I'm trying to remember where I saw this in the city. I think this is kind of west of downtown. Um, six, seven story building, double loaded corridor units on either side. As you can see, these are the older buildings, right? And they're deep and take up uh, maybe one or two lots. But these new buildings, because of the amount of land that it takes, the amount of the construction cost, um, and all these other issues, it's really difficult to get pet projects to pencil that don't have parcel assemblage. And so you have developers who have to go out and get multiple parcels of land, and so you don't get that fine-grained nature of how the city used to be. But if we look at development patterns in other parts of the world, that fine-grained nature is, is inherent in their older buildings, and it's even inherent in their new buildings. This is uh, Fredericksburg uh, inside of Copenhagen. These are all perimeter block buildings. They're generally four to six stories. Uh, they have inhabited attics, which is something we can't really do in the US. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of green here. These are quiet streets. The courtyards are communal. They're owned cooperatively by all of the buildings around it. Uh, very bike friendly, very low carbon kind of way of living. But this isn't one building taking up the whole block, right? This is lots of little buildings that are kind of crammed together. I will also note they are all single stair buildings for the most part. Um, and so there is this kind of relationship to the older parts of Edmonton uh, and this building or, uh, and, and this development. But the difference is these are taller, these are thinner. They don't take as much of the, of the uh, lot, uh, isn't as consumed to the same degree. And so there's more space for trees and community. Uh, this is an aerial of Vienna. Uh, looking into this, what do you see? You see some trees, uh, you see lots of little buildings. Here's what I see. This is social housing. This is market rate housing. This is a cooperative. This is social housing. Even at the block level, you have this really wild diversity. And then within that, you've got street trees, which help reduce the urban heat island effect. You've got uh, housing that isn't limited to arterials, right? So we're putting people in quieter places to live. The courtyards are large and generous and also have trees. Uh, this is Seattle. I think that there are parts of Edmonton that could look like this too. This is our arterial. Again, we have the deep, low-rise buildings that are slowly being uh, developed into much larger buildings that take up more lots. Uh, but there's not a lot of space for trees. There's not a lot of space for community. Uh, there's certainly not a lot of space for businesses to not be on the arterial. And so it's a very different way of, of thinking about how we develop and redevelop cities. And so a big question for me is, where is the economic and social mix in this, in this image? There's no social housing. And so I think we have to rethink uh, how we design housing for social connectivity uh, and also climate adaptation. Uh, when I landed on the airport, I thought it was a little bit smoky uh, walking around this afternoon. 
Uh, I can taste it. I can smell it. Uh, we had uh, really bad wildfires a couple of years ago. Um, and every time this comes around every year, like there's a little bit of trauma locked up in here. And like I start to go back to this period where we were trapped in our houses for three weeks. We couldn't go outside because the smoke was so bad. I'll also note this building is in Edmonton. This building does not exist outside the US and Canada. Uh, hodgepodge of materials, material mess. It's largely one bedrooms or studios for the most part. This one might be a little bit different, uh, but it's a big development. It requires lots of different parcels to be assembled to then be developed. Uh, double loaded corridor, so it's kind of like a hotel with uh, units on either side. This is the primary mode of development in almost all of North America, north of Mexico. But there are other ways of designing buildings. Uh, from your left to right, sorry, uh, the point access block. This is the workhorse of urbanism the world over, except for the US and Canada. Uh, the single loaded corridor, this is where you have a hallway on the edge of the building, can be interior, exterior, uh, much more common uh, than the double loaded corridor in the rest of the world. Extremely rare in the US, I think it's because we associate it with uh, motels and, and poor student apartments from like the 60s and 70s. And then lastly, the, the double loaded corridor, like I said, this is the one that we do almost everywhere in the US now, in Canada as well. And if we kind of zoom in on kind of what these induce, we'll start with the double loaded corridor, hallway down the middle, the shining, you've got units on either side, the units on one side are only on the street, and they don't have any respite from the, from the urban noise. Maybe the other ones face southwest, they don't have balconies, they don't have shades because we don't have an active solar protection industry. They can't ever get away from the sun and the heat in the, in the summer. Super efficient, you can get a lot of units. There are a lot of small units, there's no variability in that, there's not a good unit mix. Uh, you don't have opportunities for cross ventilation and thinking about how we're going to adapt to a warmer world, that's a big question of mine. How do we deal with you know, reducing our cooling load to the greatest extent possible? This is a project in Portland in the US. Again, it's all studios, one bedroom units, except for those three units on the corners, uh, two, two lucky two bedroom uh, households and one three bedroom household. But you have like 40 units on one floor and it's six floors tall, that's 240 units. I mean, there's a massive amount of density on this one parcel. And if I'm a family living in that three bedroom unit, there's no other family really with two other kids living on my floor, right? So there's not that economic diversity. It's really difficult to know all of the people who live on that block or on that floor. The single loaded corridor is actually a typology that I really adore. Not so common in the US, it's extremely common in Switzerland, pretty common in Germany. Uh, you can have an open uh, passageway on the exterior. It could also be closed. You guys do get a little bit of a uh, winter here in, the, in Alberta, I hear. <laughs> Uh, it's nice and warm today, but I hear it's a little bit different in, uh, in December. It's not as efficient as the double loaded corridor, but it does allow you kind of to have this diversity of unit sizes, right? You can kind of figure out how to get in two, three, even four bedroom units. It allows for cross ventilation uh, to, to come through the building so you can you know, cool it. You can get daylight on multiple sides as well. Uh, this is a pretty slick example out of Switzerland. Again, you've got the corridor up on top, it's exterior, and then all of the units kind of coming off of it. Super simple way of building. Uh, but this is, my, this is my baby, the point access block, the single stair building, the workhorse of urbanism almost around the world. Um, basically, you have a couple of units, a handful of units that are generally oriented around a central stair uh, and elevator core. It's extremely efficient, uh, usually because of size limitations and other issues, it induces larger units. So if you're trying to get more family sized units, more variability, it helps accelerate that, whereas the double loaded corridor doesn't. Um, a lot of times you'll just have two units per floor and all, both of those units are open, as Michael was saying, front and back, and you can get that cross ventilation that you really can't get in, in new construction these days. You can put all the bedrooms on the quiet side of the building, right? So there, there are ways of thinking about how we design buildings that start to really break the mold. Uh, so this is kind of a quick example. Uh, this is a one bedroom unit. You've got a little one bedroom unit here. These are both three bedroom units, right? Like this completely blows my mind that you would have a three bedroom unit and then two on the same floor, but they do. Uh, it's got an elevator, it's got a central stairway, super compact, you get cross ventilation, you've got ample light, you've got a loggia, which is like a recessed balcony, so you've got that private outdoor space too. Radically different than anything we do in the US. So the elephant in the room is, do buildings in the US burn differently than they do in the rest of the world? Do buildings in Canada burn differently than they do in the rest of the world? 
a little bit of variability to that. We build with a lot more wood in the US and Canada than other countries, but mass timber is changing the, that a little bit. But we are this strange um, outlier in, in what other countries allow. So all of the green are countries that allow six stories or taller with single stair buildings. It's almost all of Europe with the exception of the Netherlands and Ireland. Almost all of South and Central America, even Tokyo where they have earthquakes and fires and tsunamis, they're fine with it too. So it's kind of like, where did we go wrong? Quick comparison of a double loaded corridor building next to a single, single stair building. Uh, it's actually three single stair buildings put together. If I highlight the core, you start to see some of the differences between these, right? So this, this is the single stair building, the point access block. It's got three cores, each with the, its own elevator. This is a double loaded corridor, right? Right down the middle, your shining, your shining uh, hotel. There's not a lot of unit variability on the double loaded corridor on the bottom. It's one and two story building, or one and two unit apartments. If this is the south and you're on the street, you're never getting the opportunity to open your windows in the summer. But with the point access block, it's different. You've got almost all of the bedrooms positioned on the quiet side of the building, on the courtyard side of the building. You've got the opportunity to bring air in and out on both sides of your building, or even three sides if you're lucky enough to live on the end. There's a massive uh, variability in the size of units. There's studios all the way up to four bedrooms. And again, my brain goes, four bedroom units? What is that even like? But we don't even have to stop it too. In the rest of the world, they could say, look, let's just put 20, 20 single stair buildings together. This is uh, Sue and Till. This is in Winterthur, Switzerland by Weber Brunner. It's mass timber. It's passive house. It's four to six story buildings. It's got a courtyard. It's got a playground. And almost all of the units have the opportunity to cross ventilate. They all have solar protection. And you have kind of like your own little bubble. There's also a really interesting mix of rental versus ownership uh, in this building. I think it's 80-20, uh, it's predominantly renter. So even, even within that realm, there's, there's kind of this interesting mix that's happening. And so what are some of the effects with building circulation? This is something that three years ago, I don't think anybody was really thinking about. Well, in the US, with our corridor in the middle and units on either side, we get these really, really thick floor plates. We get these really deep buildings. It doesn't really leave a lot of space for trees and green or community, especially when we put the parking lot in the middle. But in Germany, you've got this much thinner building. All of your units have access to air and light on both sides of the building. These are roughly the same size, same scale, but the courtyard in the German building is significantly larger. You're not looking at your neighbors that are only 20, 30 feet away, that's 80 feet, right? So there's these subtle differences in the way that our, uh, the outcomes that our, our planning models are producing. And I really think that the double loaded corridor is pushing the limits of the building code. So I don't know about Canada, but in the US we can go up to 50 feet on a dead end corridor. And in Seattle where you have studios everywhere, I mean, how many units is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven units that if there's a fire right here, can't get to that exit. So it's, there are consequential issues around that as well. And I'll, again, I'll note, there's almost no courtyard in this building, which maybe on a really hot day like today, ample shade, maybe that's okay. But in looking at the floor plates of a project in Hamburg uh, and a project in Seattle that was re recently completed, started to think about, look, how much extra space does it take to get a similar number of units? Uh, on the left is Hamburg. Uh, it's a really elegant building, 32 units, 55 bedrooms. Uh, on the right in red, um, double loaded corridor. It's actually two buildings that form a courtyard, 60 bedrooms and 52 units. So it's almost all studios. It's almost all one bedroom units at most. There's not a lot of unit variability. There's almost the same number of bedrooms on either side. But this is the kicker for me. The floor plate in the Seattle version is 44,000 square feet. So the floor plate in Hamburg is 32,000 square feet. It's quite a bit, quite a bit of a, a difference there. 13,000 square feet for five bedrooms. So we're putting all of this effort to not get a lot of uh, output really out of it, right? And that's more cost, that's more embodied carbon. Uh, and looking at the additional cost of this building, that additional 13,000, 12,000 square feet uh, multiplied by construction costs, $4.6 million additional per floor versus the Hamburg model, multiply that by six floors. And that's not an insignificant uh, amount of money. Okay, we would have to buy uh, eight more elevators. Um, eight elevators aren't $28 million. Oh, by the way, the courtyard in Germany is significantly larger. Uh, they've got space for kids, there's gardens, right? And so all of these little things start to like add up, right? If you take this around, not just one building, but like entire districts, 
And even at the unit scale, our, our units are significantly larger than, you've, than you would find in most other countries. Uh, on the left, this is a, a two bedroom, two bath unit. Uh, in Seattle, 970 square feet would be small. We can go up to 1,200, 1,300 uh, square feet. R windows on one side, maybe two if it's on the corner. The German model, right, you get the bedrooms all on one side. You get three bedrooms in that same amount of space. You still have two bathrooms. You have a much more generous kitchen, living, dining, much more daylight, much more air movement. And it's, it's almost, uh, these are to scale. So this building is almost half of the thickness of that building. And we'll come back around to that. Um, I had at least three conversations about this picture with somebody today. Uh, so there's this question, how are our building codes, our planning codes, how are they affecting our quality of life? Um, every time I walk into a double loaded corridor, it doesn't matter if it's an apartment or it's a hotel, this is, this is all I think about. But the reality in other countries is nothing like this. This is a, a bow group, but this is co-housing in Austria. It's eight stories. All of the units open directly into this one stair. It's their only stair. There's a daylight on top. Um, they can open up the skylight and a door. And during COVID, this was this place where the community could come together and celebrate birthdays and each other in like this weird, we don't really know what the pandemic actually means, but we kind of want to see you. And we built this project with you. So we're going to, you know, at least stand here and we got some fresh air and everything is good. But this, this kind of stairway in the U.S. is completely illegal. Yet there's only one. Okay, changing speeds. How do we scale up? How do we start thinking about better neighborhoods, more livable, higher quality of life, uh, hopefully low car bin, ha, ha, ha. Um, or maybe car optional. If you, I understand that people need cars. We live in North America. It's just the reality. Um, but also the reality is the climate crisis. Uh, this was uh, Edmonton five years ago. Uh, we had the heat dome in the Pacific Northwest. 1,000 people died. Heat dome in Mexico and Texas right now. A number of people have died. Uh, flooding is only going to get worse. The U.S. industry, I feel, is completely unprepared for dealing with the climate crisis. We don't have any cities with a passive house mandate. We don't really do cooling well, especially on the West Coast, because we haven't needed it for 50 years. And so how, how are we going to start kind of shifting that, that issue? And the rain is definitely going to come. This is the city we lived in uh, in Bavaria. This is Lansut. The year after we left, this huge flood came, or this huge rain came in. And the Isar River flows through the middle of it. In the 70s, they cut this huge ditch around the city uh, so that if there was a lot of rain, downtown wouldn't flood. So it was kind of this bypass. But the rain came from the opposite side, which had never happened. And like the downtown was completely flooded in places like we had been biking and living you know, just months ago. It just completely blew my mind. And it's only going to get worse. Urban heat island mitigation is a significant issue. How do we keep our streets cool? How do we keep our communities cool? Trees, depaving. Right? And this is, this is going to become a, a bigger issue as places get hotter. And so it's, it's a, a, not just a matter of like adding trees, but thinking about how we create neighborhoods that have uh, less paving, um, more open space, more green space, more space for blue-green infrastructure so that when it rains a lot, that rain has somewhere to go. And are we thinking about what that heat is going to do to the city and to different neighborhoods? Right? So this is uh, the city of Basel is very proactive on the, on the climate action front. They're looking at what the heat temperatures are going to be at night. Uh, it says 2035. So they're thinking about what it's going to be in the future. Uh, what's really interesting to me is uh, this is the Altstadt. This is the core of the city. Of course, this is the hottest. This building's really close together. There aren't a lot of trees, a lot of paving. This red spot here, this is the, the, um, the main Bahnhof, the main train station. The zoo, lots of green space, lots of op openness. Uh, it's the coolest. And so there's this kind of variability that starts to happen. Uh, but what's interesting is you've got all of this area kind of on the outskirts. These are all like kind of small multiplexes, detached housing. Uh, they're moderately warm. Uh, and then the Zeilenbau. These are like these, uh, I, th I think you would call them slabs, right? These slab-like buildings with space between them, space for trees and, and, and for air to move around the buildings. It's really the same temperature, if not cooler, than some of those detached uh, neighborhoods. So, so thinking about how temperature is going to change and affect the, the kinds of buildings that we live, I think, is pretty important. And of course, like the public health issue extends far beyond that. Uh, noise, air pollution. In the US, we center our new developments, even if they're a brownfield, like on the arterial. In other countries, they put the arterials around the development. And so you're not running this toxicity through the core of the development. This is Rieselfeld in uh, Vauban, in, uh, in Freiburg, uh, Adam. Um, so they've got a highway here. They've got a highway here. 
This is just a tram line running through. It's a nice, quiet neighborhood. They've got semi-open uh, perimeter blocks, uh, so there's space for air to move. There's a lot of green space. Uh, and then if you look at the, this is the noise, right, through the neighborhood, right? So it's loudest here on the highway. And all this green, where all these houses are, that's where it's quiet. It's below 50 decibels at night, right? So we're making places where it's quiet at night. The mental health implications of noise are massive, and they're only really now beginning to, I think, uh, be understood to the, the degree that they should be, right? So how, how are we thinking about those things when we're planning our neighborhoods? Uh, I've had a couple of conversations tonight about building height. This is my favorite slide in the whole world. Uh, so Berlin uh, is a city where almost everything is the exact same height in the core of the city. The 22-meter Trafoa, that's the, oh man, my brain is not working. Uh, the Eve height, it's 22 meters is the, is the underside of the eaves. It's kind of as high as you can go. It's about five to six buildings. What's interesting to me is, A, that's the majority of, almost the majority of the land area of the city. Uh, so this is the number of stories, and then this is the people per hectare. And the uh, production of those five to six story buildings, right, is way more than the six to seven, way more than the seven to eight, right? And so the, what, the issue is the more height you get, the more structure you need to hold up those higher buildings, it's really difficult to get the same amount of uh, people density in, in these buildings. And so there's this really nice sweet spot. If you know Lloyd Alter, he talks about the, the golden lock, Goldilocks density, four to six stories. Uh, and that's kind of really, I like height too. But it's really in that sweet spot where we start to get issues um, around po uh, population density and affordability, at least in the US, uh, really start to make a, an interesting difference. And so I have this crazy idea that the way that we're building our cities is completely messed up. Uh, we should be doing a lot of really good brownfield development, but not thinking of it as like brownfield, re brownfield redevelopment, but thinking about it as a carbon sink. We're making these places that, are, uh, that have a high quality of life. There's this huge economic and social mix of residents. There's ample space for affordable housing. We're incorporating schools so that parents don't have to hop on their cargo bike, hopefully, but their car to take their kid to daycare, uh, and then their other kid to school, right? Everything is kind of within this, this self-contained community. It's mixed use. There's space for jobs. Uh, you've got daycare nearby. You've got grocers. Um, this is the Sonnenfeldtal in Vienna. It's an absolutely amazing place. It's only 77 acres. It's not that big, but it's 13,000 residents, uh, and it's got space for 20,000 jobs. You may notice that it's uh, right next to the train tracks. Uh, these linear long buildings here are parking garages, and they're using those parking garages to uh, make it quieter in the neighborhood itself. They're kind of deflecting the noise of the buildings. And then as you get into the district, that park, right? It's the heart of the district. Um, the trees are slowly, slowly Coming in, it is still under construction, but that heart really becomes kind of the quiet center. And I think this is the key. It's that park-oriented development that we don't do well at all in the US, and that makes space for community, space for climate adaptation, space for stormwater mitigation, uh, space for your kids to just run around and you don't have to worry about it because you're making dinner. Space where multifamily housing can be allowed on quiet streets. Um, this is in Nantes in France. Uh, we don't have any multifamily housing on a street like this. I would love to live on a street like this. And so when we're thinking about climate adapted development, what, is it, what does it entail? Is it thick buildings? Is it thin buildings? Is it buildings all of the same height? Can there be a diversity of buildings? Uh, I'll say yes. Uh, this is the Ackerman Bogen in Munich, 2,200 homes, 7,000 people. These are all relatively thin buildings. I think the thickest ones are like 50 feet. Uh, these guys here. Uh, there's a wide var variability in height. It's for like three to six, seven stories. Um, there's many different modes of housing. There's co-housing, there are cooperatives, market rate housing, social housing, flats, terrace housing, row houses. Oh, by the way, there's a huge park, so your kids can go here. These are slow streets, so you don't have to worry about your kid running down the single stair here and going to play with his buddies at the park. There's a daycare integrated into it, schools integrated into it. It's a radical departure from, I think, the way that we're developing. Um, but there's something, that's really, there's something that's really intriguing about this. I don't think this one is the answer either, um, although all that green, uh, especially on a warm day today, uh, kind of makes my heart fuzzy. Uh, also in Munich, this is the Domag Park. It's a much bigger uh, property. Uh, again, it's mostly residential. You're bounded by the arterial. So here's an arterial here, arterial here, Autobahn over here on the side. And so that park, that, that really becomes this quiet center and you have like this layering of buildings, this gradation uh, to really make that place uh, much more quieter, much more livable uh, and 
maybe a place where you can hear your neighbors screaming at each other because their TV is tuned to the wrong channel. But they've, uh, they've got a daycare here, they've got a school here, it's adjacent to the tram, it's adjacent to light rail, uh, again, wide mix of housing. This really funky looking building here is this really, uh, it's a really incredible cooperative with a, it's like radically different means of living, so kind of, I don't know how to describe this in English. It's kind of like student housing, but it's not students, right? So it's like 20 people living in one apartment, uh, and they each have their own little kind of lock-off suite, but then they share the common amenities, the kitchen, the living, the dining. And there's room between the buildings. There's room for air to flow, there's room for trees, there's room for plazas. Again, much quieter than almost anything that we ever do in the US. Nice little place to, you know, hang out with the kids, maybe barbecue. And then this is the park. This is the playground in the heart of the park. And that big recess is for stormwater mitigation, right? So it's like you're taking all of these things and you're kind of cramming in as much as possible. Uh, we were, we randomly, I didn't even know about this. We were biking around when we lived here and just like we saw the playground. It was hot. The kids wanted to play and we're like, go for it. And it's like just this wonderful neighborhood. There were a ton of kids. It was loud and beautiful. I think this is the direction we need to be going, or at least in the US. I don't, if Edmonton's, Edmonton is a little bit different, but in, in Seattle especially, Moveda Canal by Bureau of Urbanism and Okra Landscape Architects is this really small brownfield redevelopment in Utrecht in the Netherlands, 6,000 homes, uh, it's got space for jobs, cafes, restaurants, grocery stores, kind of all of those things you need to live your day-to-day -day life, uh, ample open space, stormwater mitigation, um, this project was done through an urban planning competition, which is kind of the, the typical mode of development in, in Europe. And the result is really incredible to me. So there's this green spine. This is the Merveda Canal itself. Uh, the park is kind of layered to deal with flooding. Uh, it's the Netherlands. They have water issues. But, but you might know there's a lot of green, right? So there's, like, there's a block here, and there's green in the block, and there's green here, and there's smaller buildings. It's not really big buildings. There's intentionality behind this. Each block is like this wild diversity of ownership models. There's the CPO, which is kind of like a, a bow group. It's people coming together and developing their own project. There's market rate housing, nonprofit housing, cooperatives, all on the same block. It just blows my mind because we can't even do this, do this in the same building. And they're like, hey, we can do this on the same block, and it's even better. Uh, and, and they're really thinking about like circularity and productive roofscapes. Is it for solar? Are, you, are we planting things on it? Uh, buildings are of different heights, so you can figure out where you are in this dense district, and there's some variability. It's not kind of this one flat thing that goes on forever. Um, and the other thing that this induces is better, and, uh, better airflow through the district itself, too. Uh, and so what are some of these components of the eco-districts? How can we bring this uh, to, to the US, to Canada? Just a quick run by, r rundown of kind of the things that I think are important. The one is the urban planning competition. I recently learned that you guys did an urban planning competition for, I'm going to say it wrong, Blatchford? All right. Um, I would say the process maybe wasn't the right way to go. Uh, but this is the common means of procuring projects in, in Germany, in Europe. Um, I, I love this because it's uh, what you see is what you get, right? You look at this diagram and you kind of know what it's going to look like. You know there's going to be space for trees. You kind of know what the urban form is going to look like. The city can go around and collect data. They can see what people want, what they need in their community. They can incorporate this into their projects. Uh, they'll have a brief written up. Firms uh, send a response. Um, you know, this is what we think it'll look like. Building A, building B. And then those are judged. They're judged on sustainability, mobility, the housing mix that's within it, uh, the form of the urban, the urban form, uh, and the amount of open space as well. Um, like I said, what you see is what you get. This is the Leopold, Caserna, and Regensburg invited competition. It was an ideas competition, so it wasn't necessarily going to be built. But they invited all of these firms and said, look, we have these, these goals. It's got to be thinking about the future, climate, heat. Uh, we want a good mix of residents. We've got to have outdoor spaces, uh, ample homes. We want to incorporate all those things we need for day-to-day -day life. Uh, and then this is the, the winning competition by I ISS Research Architecture and Urbanism out of Berlin. Again, we've got that park. Here in the middle, this little blue thing that's a retention pond. It's bounded by the arterials. There's a highway here. There's this gradation uh, so that the closer you get to the, uh, the residential components, they've got commercial on the periphery, right? The quieter it gets. <laughs> There's car-free streets. There's ways to walk around the neighborhood so that your children can go to visit their friends and they don't have to interact with cars at all. 
They have uh, centralized garages, so cars aren't kind of going through the neighborhood. Uh, places for community to come together. Semi, uh, semi-enclosed courtyards for the residents who live in them. Gardens. It's like, how the, how the heck are you able to cram so much stuff into one little thing? Oh, and by the way, you know, climate is central to this. Making spaces that are conducive to living a high quality of life that aren't loud is central to this. It allows opportunities to rethink urbanism. Um, so, so much of what we do here in the US and Canada is like this weird status quo. We're like not really uh, open to challenging ideas. Uh, the city of Copenhagen uh, held a competition that was won by Henning Larson a couple years ago. It's in this in-between space, it's not quite city, it's not quite village. Henning Larson said, okay, combine them. <laughs> it's a village in the city, a city in the village. And so they get this new typology urban space, and then it falls away to kind of suburban places. Mass timber, social housing, green space, open space, right? Like, there's this wild mix of things going on. Um, but it's also in a green field, so it's like, ah, almost, almost there. Um, also really important is this concept of mitmakin, making with, participatory planning. We're really bad about this in the US. Uh, I feel like you guys are actually better in conversations I've had tonight uh, here in Edmonton about talking to people, what do they need in there? in their neighborhoods, um, it's, it's really crucial. It's not just for, for buy-in, uh, but it's for ensuring the, the health of the community, that people get the things that they need, the services that they need. Um, maybe Germany is probably better at funding those things than Seattle, which is one of the reasons I, I feel like it takes off. Also crucial is having a really good economic and social mix of residents. Uh, TOD in the US is almost exclusively market rate housing. Maybe there's a token uh, affordable housing, social housing project. Um, in Vienna, 50, 60, 70% of the units around their new developments are intended to be social housing. They've got this very radical approach in, in the way that they do it. Um, this is one of those projects. This is the Brio. Uh, it's social housing. It's mass timber. Housing for single parents. Housing for seniors. There's affordable artists' ateliers. It's got a daycare, community spaces. Again, it's like this concept of kind of like cramming as much into the box as possible. And for me, like Vienna, doesn't do everything right, but they do this right, and this building would never be possible in the US. Thinking about how we rehabilitate our streets, again, trees, blue-green infrastructure is a critical component of it. Are we prioritizing space for deep, what is it, re-democratizing the streets? And that open space, it's so, it's so critical. Uh, the TOD that I showed you in Seattle, there was almost no open space almost no trees, that means there's no space for community, there's no space for a farmer's market, there's no place for your kids to go outside uh, and maybe you can watch them or at least hear them uh, because it's loud and there's, there's just no playground. And so this really comes back to this concept of, of thin buildings. This is a wild departure from the way that we do things here in, in the US and Canada, I think. But most of the buildings that I've showed today from, from Europe are between 40 and 50 feet uh, deep, the floor plates. Um, I have this document that was written by uh, urban planning, federal urban planning department in, uh, it's kind of, uh, I guess it's, you guys don't have HUD, uh, it's an American thing. But it's kind of our, the main urban, urban development wing of the government. It, it talks about extreme building depths uh, and the, the widest one, the deepest one is 60 feet. And we have units in double loaded corridors in Seattle where just one side of the unit is 50 feet. So you add the hallway, you're at 60 feet and then we add another row of units, right? So we're taking this concept of extreme depth and just blowing it out of, out of proportion. And so what that means is you don't have space for community gardens. You don't have all of this activated space on the ground floor. You don't have open space. Your residents are looking much closer at each other. So there's much less privacy. The noise mitigation one is a big one for me. Uh, the building uh, on the south side of this building is the Autobahn. You'll notice this long linear building here. This entire building is oriented towards the courtyard on the opposite side of the Autobahn. It's got additional insulation, three pane windows. It's basically acting, uh, I don't know anybody who plays hockey for Edmonton, but it's like your defensive lineman who's like shielding everybody from getting to the goalie, right? So the, the noise stays all back here and the goal, uh, the goal of that neighborhood is nice and quiet. Another project that does the same thing. Again, all of the units are on the opposite side of this building. It's a single loaded corridor. It's next to a shunting yard, which is you know where they jam the chains together to make them longer. 
and add more coal. Um, it's next to an U-Bahn stop. There's a highway. It's kind of like all of this noise. Corridor right here on the edge of the building with more amenity space, community meeting rooms, workshops. And then all of the units open up to the other side of the building. And you can't really see it in this image, but it's green. It's lush. Uh, we went and visited it for the Passive House uh, conference a couple years ago. And it's just ridiculously quiet. And I want to talk about Passive House for a second. So uh, there is no place in the US that mandates Passive House. Um, Canada is starting to get there. Uh, British Columbia has a building code and energy code that requires steps or incentives, I'm not quite sure, uh, that start to get there. But Passive House is just a way of building. It's uh, super energy efficient, uh, a little bit of extra insulation, three pane windows. Do you guys, you guys probably require three pane windows here, right? It's cold. No, I'm seeing lots of no's. Okay, it's coming, all right. Uh, and there are additional benefits of that as well, right? Noise mitigation and other things. Um, what's really fascinating to me is Passive House is a way of building that mitigates a lot of the issues uh, around climate change that I think we're going to have to start adapting to. It's airtight. You've got a ventilation system that has filters on it, so it's working to keep out the smoke during smoke season. Uh, it's got, uh, in Europe more so than here, it's got better shading. So on hot events, if the power goes out, uh, there are ways to mitigate the heat so your space isn't overheating. It's really kind of this interesting way of doing passive survivability uh, as compared to, to kind of the code minimum. Uh, what you can do. In effect, this is the way that the, uh, the European U Union requires all buildings to be built now. And so there's this weird duality. I've been talking about Passive House for a decade, no, longer than a decade, and it's still not very common here in the US. But it's like every building I worked on in Germany four years ago, it's, it was like, okay, we'll do Passive House, yeah. Okay, we need that uh, window, yeah, it's fine. It's just what it costs. Uh, solar protection, like I said, this is an industry that doesn't exist in the U.S. at all. Uh, if, I wanna, if I want exterior shading, I either have to import it from Austria or Germany, or I live in Seattle, we're near the water, there are sail makers, maybe I can get them to make me some custom sail job. Um, I love this project. There are like four different kinds of exterior shading devices on it. Uh, it helps keep the building cool, privacy, it reduces your cooling demand so that you don't need a large air conditioner if you do need an air conditioner. Uh, this building is in Edmonton from 1915, I think, at former city hall. Look at, look at, it's got awnings. We used to know how to do this. We can still do this. Uh, like I said, I'm really big into mass timber. I'm not so big into CLT. It's a lot of fiber. It costs a lot of money. Uh, we're 20 years behind the EU on CLT. And meanwhile, the EU is going further. Uh, they're really doing some creative stuff around the value-added wood industry, more space for insulation or services dealing with noise and all of those things. Um, and also thinking about how do we decarbonize our buildings. So Alberta has an agricultural ecosystem, yes? And you have ample straw, yes? <laughs> Why not build multifamily housing and wrap it in prefabricated straw panels so you can make passive house? This is actually a multifamily project in, from a multifamily project in Switzerland. Uh, three, four stories, mass timber, Passive house, uh, lime, clay, interior finishes. Like it's, this is what I want to be doing. The ecosystem isn't quite there yet here. Are we rethinking how we move people and goods in, in, in the city? Uh, the city of Stuttgart has done some really interesting stuff around utilizing trams and cargo bikes to move packets and logistics. Again, it's, it's pushing that envelope, allowing new things to happen. Uh, centralizing our garages so that we don't have one big parking lot, right? We're keeping it compact. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Perfect. Uh, and then what other things are we bringing into this? Is there, are there opportunities to utilize it for community benefits? Is there a youth center? Uh, can we put a packet uh, distribution center here? Um, right? How do we start to cram as many things into that box as possible? Also, I think uh, adapti adaptability and flexibility are also crucial. This is a mass timber garage that was designed in Denmark by Yaya Architects. The concept behind this is over time, people stop using cars. What happens to the space in the garage? Well, they become offices. They become um, uh, workout rooms. They become spin studios, right? Like the, the options that are there, if you're, you're thinking about that flexibility, start to increase dramatically. Housing diversity, again, I can't express this enough. This is another project in Freiburg, a buddy of mine worked on from K9 Architecton. 
This is a new eco district, uh, just this huge diversity. Duplexes, small plexes, uh, large perimeter block buildings, uh, social housing, market rate housing, uh, Baugruppen, cooperatives, uh, market rate units, flats, maisonettes, you know, two-story units, right? So it's just like the amount of things that they're doing in this just completely blow my mind. But how do we do that in a way that is scalable? Can we do that with small buildings that we repeat over and over and over around the city? This is a really small building, social housing, uh, four units. But when we start to look at what the interior of that single stair building allows, there are 20 different configurations. So they can take the same building, build it 20 different times, and each iteration of that would be completely different, right? So you could have one that's got uh, predominantly kind of maybe smaller building units, or you have another one that's predominantly larger units. It's hard to do that if you have a double loaded corridor building, especially on the small scale. And that simplicity, I think, is crucial. It allows us to utilize that interior in a more varied way to get more of a mix. Right, how can we take something that's really simple, a box, but make everything inside it different? It's not all studios. It's not all one bedrooms. There's a good multi-generational mix. There's housing for families, housing for seniors, housing for single parents, housing for students, teenager suites. What is that? Um, I'm also a big proponent of Baugruppen. Baugruppen are uh, urban, self-developed uh, housing. It's kind of like co-housing, but without some of the um, granola aspects of it. So there's generally not a common house. The legal form can vary. It could be a cooperative. It could be an LLC. Um, basically, the entire concept of this is a bunch of families come together, or a bunch of residents, potential residents, households, and you cut out the developer and you cut out the, um, the real estate costs. And in C a city like Seattle, you're reducing total construction costs almost 25%. Germany's been doing this for 20 years. The city of Freiburg, where I, I was introduced to this concept, has been doing it since the 90s. Um, it's a really phenomenal way to get a better mix of middle class housing into, into buildings that you know, for a middle class household normally wouldn't be able to, to buy into. So like in Vancouver, It's really expensive to buy a house. And people my age and younger are effectively locked out of the market. And there's a whole host of reasons for it. Um, I view Baugruppen as a way of opening up more of those opportunities, right? It's saying, look, maybe there's an elderly resident who knows that he can't or she can't uh, stay in that uh, two-story house long term. So she talks to her friend who's like, oh, my daughter and her family need a place to live. And you kind of grow this little network. And all of a sudden, you've got the ability to redevelop multi-generational, climate-adaptive, community-oriented housing where this one uh, detached house once stood. So it's kind of like this radical notion or twist in the way that we normally do things. Uh, super common in Germany. It's becoming more common in Austria. A lot of cities are uh, proactive in kind of helping the formation of these. Hamburg is really good. Freiburg is really good. There are other cities where it's like market rate. Uh, Berlin is one of them. Uh, there are always questions about land. So one of the things that cities can do is say, hey, look, we own this land, and we would rather have it go to middle class families and seniors than market rate development. Uh, we're not going to put it up on the market. We're going to say, which group comes up with the best ideas? Uh, and then we're going to judge it. Who's got the passive house? Who's got the passive house and the mass timber? Who's got the multi-generational housing? Who's got the LGBTQIA friendly housing? Uh, and like, how far can you go? There's a, a Baugruppe in Tübingen that has refugee housing in it. Like, come on. You're not getting that in market rate development. We've, we've been trying to do this in Seattle for a decade now, on and off, uh, taking the concept of what you would normally see, mostly studios and one-bedroom units, maybe a two-bedroom at the corners, uh, and really just change the paradigm. This is a, uh, two brothers who owned this lot in a part of the city where you could do a little bit denser development. They didn't want to sell it to a market rate developer. They wanted to stay here. They wanted to build their families and lives here in this building. So he said, let's take the extent of what we can do in Seattle with our single stair, our single stair legislation, our point access blocks. We can do up to six floors. Let's say it's all two and three bedroom units. You can even take those three bedroom units and turn them into four bedroom units. Minimize the circulation, uh, thinner building, more room for a, a courtyard. And this is what we came up with. Uh, Major street, so the bedrooms, quiet side of the building, 
wet core down the middle where all the bathrooms go. Again, ample light for the kitchen, living, dining spaces, private balconies. Uh, we had visions of mass timber, passive house, making it the most climate adaptive kind of building that we could really do. Uh, and then interest rates shot through the roof and the brothers were like, we can just sell this land uh, and I don't blame them. Um, earlier I talked about this concept of cluster of Onion. This is a project in Switzerland by Duplex Architect in, uh, that really exemplifies this. Again, this, this goes back to this concept of like how do we incentivize or induce uh, not just alternative forms of housing, but, but more varied forms of housing. Uh, this is really a duplex. One unit here and one unit here. And each one of these little buildings or little blocks is, is kind of its own lock-off suite. So you could have a senior resident here. This one has two bedrooms. This could be a mom and her single kid. Uh, this one is just a studio. Maybe this is a, a couple, right? So there's this weird mixing going on at the unit level and there's this wide diversity of common spaces. Kitchen, dining, living area one. Maybe this is like a little library, co-working space. There's a co-working space over here as well. So it's really about kind of maximizing or optimizing everyone's economic input to come up with a space that's a little bit better. There's light on multiple sides. It's larger. You have built-in community. We're not very good at this. And so when you take all of this together, this is the Neckar Bogan uh, district in Heilbronn. When you take all of these kind of concepts and you, and you cram them down into the district scale, what do you get? In Seattle, this would be three separate buildings. Block one, block two, block three. There wouldn't be much open space. There wouldn't be much green space. Maybe there'd be a couple of affordable housing units. That's not what they did here. 10-story mass timber building, cooperative, social housing, market rate housing, Bao Grupa, right? So they said, look, we own the land and we're gonna get this mix. We need this economic and social mix here. We need housing for a broad spectrum of residents uh, and this is how we're gonna do it. And so these buildings look different because they are. Think about that first building that I showed you that said doesn't exist in, in Europe or much of the rest of the world, right? This is modern development in Germany. This is modern development in Austria, in the Netherlands, in Mexico, in Tokyo, it's just maybe taller, different materials, but it looks more like this than it does that we find in the US context. Um, so that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, do I have to turn this off? What we're going to do is pass it to the aisle when you're done yours. Just put your hand up, pass it to the aisle, and I'll ask Eric maybe and Josh maybe if you can help go up and down the aisles and help collect all the questions. Um, so what, one thing I just wanted to share is like one of the reasons I wanted Michael to come now is you know many of us have been engaged in this zoning bylaw renewal conversation about what you can build where in Edmonton. But beyond that, I just wanted to say put aside the zoning bylaw for a second. Edmonton grew. 20,000 people per year for the last 10 years in a row. So we're adding the city of Beaumont every single year to the city of Edmonton. Where should those communities be?